I'm Nirav Shah, the director of the Maine CDC. I'm pleased to join you this afternoon to talk about where we are with respect to COVID-19 for the entire state of Maine for today, Wednesday, September 8th, 2021. I begin today's update on a sad note. The Maine CDC is reporting six additional COVID-related deaths today. They include residents of Aroostook, Hancock, Lincoln, Penobscot, Somerset, and Waldo counties. Three were women and three were men. One was in their 50s, one in their 60s, two in their 70s, and two in their 80s. There have now been 946 deaths associated with COVID-19 in Maine since the beginning of the pandemic. I'd like to take a moment to offer our deepest condolences to these six individuals, as well as all 946 who have passed away, and offer those condolences to their friends, family members, and communities. Right now in the state, there are a total of 78,803 cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 732 cases between Saturday and today. Of those cases, 5,705 5, are among healthcare workers, and 2,342 have been hospitalized. Right now in the state, there are 187 people who have been hospitalized with COVID-19 just right now. 67 of those 187 are in a critical care unit, and 32 are on a ventilator. Statewide, we have a total of 328 critical care unit beds, 42 of which are staffed and available right now. In terms of testing, our seven day PCR positivity rate stands at 5.4% as of this morning. And our PCR testing volume stands at 375 PCR tests for every 100,000 people. Also on the testing front, I wanted to provide an update to everybody on where we are with our review of positive tests that are waiting for case investigation or assignment here at Maine CDC. As of this morning, we have 2,441 positive COVID-19 labs that are awaiting review. We are right now receiving anywhere from 420 to 440 positive results every single day that are adding on to the stack that we have to review. We've again added additional individuals to make sure we are working our way through that. But what this means is that on any given day, the number of new cases is driven as much by the number of labs that we've been able to review as it is by the number of new cases. As we make progress over the next several more days, we anticipate that there will be sustained high numbers of cases as we work our way through those 2,441 positive labs. Turning next to COVID-19 vaccinations. Right now, 72% of the entire population of Maine, about 968,000 people, have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. And two out of every three people in Maine, including those under the age of 12, two out of every three have completed their vaccine series, representing about 890,000 people who are now fully vaccinated. I wanna to turn next to something that we haven't touched on in a bit, and that is PPE. We've got a good update there. Our intrepid public health emergency preparedness team has continued, has continued to deliver PPE resources to frontline healthcare workers across the state. As of this morning, we had surpassed over 5,000 orders of PPE that have been fulfilled, 5,039 to be exact. This equates to over 8 million items of PPE that have shipped to healthcare providers across the state since we began our operations. 
Now, this PPE delivery operation has been in addition to, for example, the delivery of vaccines, testing supplies, swabs, viral transport media that the public health emergency preparedness team has continued to undertake. I wanted to take a second to recognize them and thank them for, for their efforts since even before we had our first case of COVID-19. As folks will recall, we were delivering and stocking up on supplies of PPE well before our first case, and we have continued to do so ever since. And finally, I wanted to take a minute to talk with everybody about testing. I want to acknowledge that access to testing remains a challenge across the country and across the state. Now this challenge, this shortage of testing comes down to two things, supply and demand. On the supply side, testing supplies across the country and within the state are strained right now. And on the demand side, well, the demand for testing has been rising for a few weeks now in light of the Delta variant surge. And as a result of those two factors, the demand has outpaced supply. What that means for you is that you may have to wait longer than you wish or travel farther than you want in order to get a COVID-19 test right now. And depending on the type of test you take, it may take longer than average for your results to come back. None of that is acceptable in the midst of a pandemic. And one of our team's top priorities right now is to expand access to testing more broadly across the state. Ever since the beginning of the Delta surge, we've been working to address these bottlenecks. And to be sure, those efforts are bearing fruit. PCR testing volume in the state is up 51% in the past 30 days. And antigen testing volume is up 55% over the past 30 days. We've also revised our testing website to make it easier for you to find a spot near you and get the kind of test you want. You can find that at maine.gov slash COVID-19 slash testing. But I wanna be the first to acknowledge for you that we have heard loud and clear the concerns that we have, been, we have heard voiced from folks across the state of Maine. More needs to be done to expand the availability of testing. And we are working on it, both with our partners here at the state, within the state, as well as with our partners at the federal level, with manufacturers of testing, as well as with the federal government to make sure we've got everything we need to make testing as available as possible. That, chain, that, that supply chain concern may persist for a while. And as a result, testing may be a bit challenging for a while. But as we know more, and as we bring on new assets for testing, we will make sure to let everybody know. And finally, before we turn to questions, one note about these briefings. As folks will have realized, we have resumed them right now on a weekly basis. And that's because of all of the concerns that we've heard that each of you have voiced in light of the surge of the Delta variant, increase in cases, increasing positivity rates, increasing hospitalizations. We wanna make sure that we're communicating and conveying the latest information to every single person in Maine as we know it. So for now, we'll be, we'll be bringing these briefings back let us hope that the situation eases so we can soon take these back offline. But with that, I'm gonna turn now to our colleagues in the media. The first question for the afternoon goes to Brian Sullivan. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, I'll start with, uh, uh, your, in your work with the Department of Education, what are you seeing in, in Maine schools? Uh, we're getting viewer reports here, you know, cases and positive cases around area schools. Um, what does the, the landscape look like? And is there any reason for optimism once uh, after these kids have come back together that some of these positive cases are, are dealt with and can be, I guess, cut out and then try to move past it? You know, I, just give me a reason for optimism that school can stay in session together in person. Yep, uh, that's a great question, Brian, and something that we've been discussing uh, with our colleagues at DOE for quite some time. And of 
course, more recently. Let's start with the premise of your question, which I agree with. Much of what we are detecting right now in these first days back to school is effectively community transmission that was occurring over the summer that's now being detected as kids come back into the classroom. Brian, the second part of your question is, well, what happens after this initial set of cases? And the honest answer is, it's too early to tell. Uh, it's, we hope that because of the quick and aggressive measures that schools have taken, these initial cases that were diagnosed and detected will be just that, initial cases, and not necessarily be fountains for transmission. But it's too early to tell. Let me say one other thing, though. Uh, as you talked about, as you noted, uh, what does this mean for the school year? Our expectation remains that in-person education continue throughout the school year. Indeed, most of, if not all of our processes are designed around keeping kids in the classroom, recognizing the importance of in-person, in-classroom education. What this means after this initial group of kids have now been isolated and where we go from here, that's a question we're going to be seeing. We've got a team of folks now that are dedicated on a full-time basis to understanding where we are with schools, keeping tabs of new cases, and jumping on them as soon as we can. Again, there too, as we learn more, Brian, about what the future holds, we'll make sure we keep everyone posted. Thank you. And just, uh, I believe I'm pronouncing it correctly, like the, the Greek letter, uh, the mu variant, and uh, what... Maine CDC's dealings with that have been and, and the uh, prevalence of it, if any, here in the state of Maine. Yep, uh, it's, you are correct that the mu variant, uh, as well as one of the intermediaries, the Lambda variant, I, I know they are top of everyone's mind right now. They've received some more recent media coverage. Uh, the mu variant has been detected now around the world. Uh, the mu variant, although it has some concerning factors around its potential ability to spread and maybe even interact with the vaccine in concerning ways. Right now, we don't know enough about it uh, to really make any pronouncements about what it will mean for the future of the pandemic. The bottom line right now, Brian, is that although it's always a good idea to look off into the future to see what might be coming at us, the Delta variant is what is squarely with us and in front of us right now. And that's a variant that we know is far more contagious and as a result of that, is causing more cases, more hospitalizations, and sadly, even more deaths. But it's not something that we are powerless against. And so if these variants are concerning you, you've got a tool. And that tool is to go get vaccinated. Because at least as to the Delta variant, the vaccines remain extremely effective against them. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, let me go to Patty White next. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. I'm wondering if you can give us some insight into Maine's case rates. On the one hand, our overall, our overall case rate is low compared to other states, but we now have, according to one tracker, the highest rate of growth in cases in the country. Can you just tell us why you think that is, why Maine is seeing such a high rate of growth compared to other states? Yep. I'm glad you raised that, Patty. Our, our team was, was chatting about this as well. Um, and Eric Russell from the Press Herald is not on, but Joe is. Something I've, I've chatted with Eric about. Um, there's a couple things going on here. Uh, the first is a relatively dramatic decline in case rates in states that were previously at the top of that list. Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana. Some of that, no doubt, a function of drop-off in testing from Ida, but some of it may also be that there are outbreaks at peak. It's way too early to know for sure. But when those, when those leaders have fallen off, then other states have an opportunity to move up. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean things, mean things are worse here in Maine than they are in, say, Mississippi. Uh, from a disease, an infectious disease standpoint, I don't think there's many folks that would want to trade places with their counterpart or their equivalent in one of the southern states because even though their rates are coming down, they're still really, really high as compared to Maine. The second thing that's happening, Patty, is um, with, these, with these types of things, there is a bit of a carousel effect. Um, infectious diseases, particularly COVID, take a bit of time to work their way across the country. We've seen that throughout COVID. We've seen it with other respiratory viruses like RSV, another virus that's out there. It starts in the South, 
and it takes time to work its way north. That's partly what we're seeing now. Whereas other states in the mid-Atlantic and in the southeast experienced really significant increases in Delta one week, two week, three weeks ago, we here in Maine are just now taking that turn in the carousel. We've seen that before in the pandemic, indeed during previous surges. The third thing that's happening, Patty, is that relative to other states, like in the South and the Southeast, because we had fewer people who had previously had COVID, thanks to the good work we did, there were more uninfected people here who, when a variant is introduced, like the Delta variant, can, are more susceptible to COVID because there are so many more uninfected people here. That's one reason why variants like Delta have moved even more quickly through places like the Northeast, particularly Maine, because even though vaccination rates were high, there were still a sizable number of people who had never been exposed and thus had no immunity whatsoever. Okay, thanks. And following up on Brian's question about schools, can you tell us how many outbreaks the CDC is investigating in schools currently? And if you have any other numbers you can share about the numbers of students or staff? I don't know if you have those at your fingertips. Um, we do not, we don't have the, I don't have the exact numbers and we'll get you the exact number of outbreaks. I've got them in my notes here. Um, the number is, as you can imagine, very much in flux. Uh, the Department of Education will be posting those on their website um, on a, I believe, weekly basis, as we did last school year, uh, to make sure folks know which schools are currently in outbreak status. Uh, I'll get you, they're, they're buried in my notes here, Patty, but I'll fish them out about the current number of open outbreaks that we've got in schools. Um, one number that is also worth noting is where we stand with respect to pooled testing, which is a critical part of our school safety infrastructure. Uh, right now, we have seen 21 positive pools this school year, 13 so far this week, on top of eight from previous weeks. Uh, this is out of about 450 total pools. Um, so that number is, is high and, and that's concerning, but at the same time, it's also proof positive that pooled testing is doing what diagnostic and surveillance testing are designed to do, which is to find cases and intervene upon them, hopefully before they cause outbreaks. Thank you. Sure thing, Patty. Uh, let me go to Megan from WMTW next. Uh, thank you for taking my question, Dr. Shaw. The first one's really uh, probably just a quick answer, but I was curious when you're talking about the demand and supply of testing, does that impact pooled testing in schools? Do schools have the right amount of tests to do that? Um, thanks for raising that, Megan. Let me I let me just, um, just, sorry, I wanted to fish through my notes real quick to get an answer to Patty's question here. Uh, okay, Patty, um, as of this morning, we have 10 open outbreaks in schools. I just wanted to get you that answer ASAP. Okay, yep. Um, so 10 open outbreaks in schools have this, as of this morgan, morning. Uh, Megan, to your question, the answer is unfortunately yes. That has been a concern. Uh, the, uh, the relative lack and scarcity of the rapid antigen tests uh, is something that might make it a little bit harder for schools to undertake pooled testing. Here's why. When a pool comes back positive, the next step in the process is to test all of the kids in that pool with one of the rapid tests. And when those are scarce, it makes it harder to do that next step. What we've done as a result is two things. First is prioritize the tests that we have to make sure that those go to schools so that they can undertake pool testing with the goal of keeping kids in the classroom. The second thing is going back to the manufacturer to make sure we are getting all of the rapid tests that we've ordered. We've been working with them and we know that their supply lines are strained, but we've been working with them to make sure that we are getting a steady stream of those antigen tests so we can get them to schools. Again, all with the goal of keeping kids in school. So I'm sorry, just to clarify. So have we been getting everything that we're asking for from them? Um, we we have not yet, but okay. we know again that their their supply chains are strained as well. 
we've been pushing them to make deliveries to Maine a priority. So again, we can keep kids in school. Okay. And my final question is, you know, I've been talking to some parents um, uh, as, as kids go back to school and, you know, it's really hard as you just mentioned, you know, just minutes ago that y you don't really like to look into the future. You're not in the business of, of trying to predict the future. But I think a lot of people are wondering, what are some of the benchmarks where we know that we are making progress and we're sort of seeing, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel? So what are some of the things that we need to be doing or seeing in order to feel like we're making progress in this pandemic? Sure, Megan. Um you know, um, what's interesting about that is that um, some of the benchmarks for progress with respect to COVID, some of them are new, but some of them are the same ones that we have talked about since the very beginning of the pandemic. So some of the ones that are new are, of course, first and foremost, vaccination rates. Now, we're relative to other states, relative to other countries, in an extremely strong place. Two out of every three people you meet on the street in Maine will have been fully vaccinated. That's fantastic. But in the era of the Delta variant, it's not where it needs to be. So vaccination rate is one such metric, Megan. Another that I think is quite important right now is the number of folks who are in the hospital. Right now, we're not at the highest we've ever been, but we're starting to be in that ballpark. It'd be great if that number could come down. That would be a sign that statewide the impact of the pandemic is easing. And then third, another metric that we're keeping an eye on in connection with what I noted before is where we are on testing volumes. Because even though a large fraction of the state has been vaccinated, those, have, th those who haven't been still need to make sure they've got access to testing. And even if you have been vaccinated, if you've got symptoms, you too should get access to testing. So we're keeping an even closer eye than normal on our testing volume to make sure we're increasing that as the Delta variant continues to surge. So those three things, vaccination rates, which is a newer one, but hospitalization rates and testing volumes, those three things I think are some of the key metrics right now that help us think about where we're going with the pandemic. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Joe, over to you. Okay, I assume you mean me, so thank you uh, for <laughs> taking our questions today. Uh, d just piggybacking on on the last question about vaccination rates, um, uh, amongst those currently eligible to be vaccinated, there's still more than 300,000 or so who have not yet gotten their shots. And uh, I, I know there's been some increases in vaccination lately, but when I look at the line on the website, it still looks a lot like a plateau. And so I'm wondering, is there any new strategies, anything that can be done to really make a dent in that last 300,000? <laughs> uh, yeah, Joe, that's um, certainly been top of mind lately. Um, you know, the, for, for, the remaining, for the remaining set of folks who haven't yet or chosen not to be vaccinated, uh, well, there, there, are, there are two categories of folks there, Joe. One are those who have not yet been able to be vaccinated, uh, maybe because they haven't been able to make it work for their schedule or they still have lingering questions. Uh, that's a group that we can work with and have been working with. Uh, a week or two ago, I think I, I talked about the extreme ground game where folks one on one, answering their questions one on one, getting back to them with data that they've asked for. That's sort of what we're doing for those folks who are still to some degree in that movable middle. There's another group that is, at least by their own report, immovable, and at least as it relates to public health authorities. It continues to be, based on what we're seeing in the data, continues to be the case that there is one group that can move that group of folks, and that continues to be their own doctors. So we've been equipping doctors in Maine, both with the vaccine, but also with talking or with kits to approach patients to go out and, and get them in the office to get them vaccinated. Um, you know, right now we're sort of, we're beyond the, the large scale vaccination type phase that we saw in December and January. Uh, and now it's gonna be almost a person to person interaction. 
Uh, just fo uh, following up here real quick, I'm just going to, uh, following up with that, is, are there, is there a population of people who are willing to get their flu shot and maybe when they come in to get, but so far I haven't gotten their COVID shot, and maybe when they come in to get their flu shot, you can get them to get their COVID shot. And then my other question is just uh, with the um, extracurricular activities at school, uh, for the winter or later, th those are a lot of uh, activities where people are congregating closely um, with sports or band, uh, the school play, et cetera. Um, is there any thought about, if not a, a, a mandate to have them get vaccinated to participate, like an extra push to, uh, to get them uh, to get their shots? <laughs> On the former, Joe, um, first of all, you took away my closer, but that's okay. Um, the, uh, the, the discussion around flu shots, it's possible that there are folks who haven't yet signed up for their COVID shot, but would like to get their flu shot. If so, um, certainly if they are going to a pharmacy or something of that sort, they have the opportunity of getting both. As we talk about boosters, we're looking at whether it's possible to offer both flu shots as well as booster COVID shots. Uh, we haven't made any final calls on that. Uh, there are some operational considerations we've got to bear in mind there. But at baseline, Joe, there's nothing that prevents somebody from a medical or scientific perspective from getting their flu shot in their left arm and their COVID shot in their right arm on the same day. Uh, as to your latter question, we haven't discussed those sort of school-based uh, mandates that are activity-based or sector by sector in that respect. Uh, we haven't discussed those, uh, so I can't, I can't weigh in further. I'm not, uh, I'm not really even sure what the, what the pulse of the discussion is with the Department of Education and various schools there. Uh, let me go next to Blair at WGME. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. So hospitals in Maine are now having to postpone non-urgent surgeries due to an influx of COVID patients. What does this say about the state of the pandemic here in Maine? Yeah, Blair, you're, you're right. Um, some hospitals in Maine have started to postpone um, or delay elective procedures. And we use that word elective, but I don't think we talk about what that means and the impact that that has on real people. Elective procedures these days are things like preventive screenings for really important things, or a hip replacement for somebody who has been grappling with longstanding arthritis. And in many of these instances, when that care is delayed, it can often be denied outright because after time goes on so far, the condition can become so much more exacerbated as to make even the surgical procedure not something that's curative. So what that says about the pandemic is that we're entering or are in a deeply concerning phase right now. The Delta variant in particular is giving us all a run for our money. And in particular, because it causes so many more cases, it's leading to more hospitalizations. That unfortunately is putting an immense amount of strain on hospitals as a system, but in particular on healthcare workers. Healthcare workers, nurses, and other staff within hospitals have to contend with both patients whose care has been delayed, as well as COVID patients all at the same time. Now, I wanna, I wanna zero in on folks who, who haven't been vaccinated because I hear a lot and I see a lot folks saying, well, I haven't been vaccinated, but that's my business and not your business. And my decision not to get vaccinated, well, that doesn't harm you. That doesn't affect you in any way. It's my choice and it doesn't, it doesn't impact your life at all. But what we're seeing now, Blair, is that that's not true. Our hospitals are filled with individuals who are being treated for COVID who are not vaccinated. Indeed, just earlier today, I was on a call with leadership of hospitals across the state of Maine. And one by one, they all recounted how in their facilities, their COVID units are filled with unvaccinated patients. 
and their ICUs are filled almost uniformly with unvaccinated patients. When those beds get filled up, who doesn't get care? Who doesn't get care are our elderly parents who maybe needed that bypass graft that's got to get put off another day. Or our elderly friends and family members who needed that hip replacement that gets put off another day. So your decision not to get vaccinated doesn't just affect you. It doesn't just affect your family. It affects other people when they need health care the most. And so going off of that, um, registered nurse today at a protest over the vaccine date says that the vaccines are experimental and they need to be, there needs to be more long-term studies before asking medical workers to get them. So, so what's your response to that? Well, th that nurse is wrong. Uh, at least the Pfizer vaccine has now been fully authorized, uh, fully approved by the US FDA. The other vaccines are certainly not in an experimental phase. They've received an emergency use authorization and the regulatory bodies of not just the United States, but dozens of other countries, including Canada, Western Europe, and other countries in Asia have granted those vaccines full approval, if not emergency use authorization. We can always say that we need more studies and more data. It's always useful to have more data. But in the midst of the pandemic, the fundamental question remains, which is the bigger risk? The risk of our hospitals being filled with COVID patients, blocking care for others who need it, or the risk of a vaccine? Even the mRNA vaccine, which I know folks have questions about, are nothing more than a couple of particles of mRNA, a fat cell, and some a compound called PEG, which has been injected into people as part of other medications for decades, and, and a little bit of salt. That is all they are. If there were long-term considerations from these, then we would have started to see them based on other mRNA vaccines. Thank you. Uh, let me go to Emily at the Sun Journal next. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Shaw. So I wanted to start with um, testing in terms of the increased volume lately. I think this is the third week now you've mentioned this backlog. Um, so first of all, why why are we suddenly seeing this backlog? Because I you know I know testing volume um, it still doesn't compare completely to the height. You know we were seeing maybe ten you were getting uh, significantly more tests per day. Um, and then second to that, how do we kind of interpret these new daily cases with this backlog? Good. Let me let me start with your second question, Emily. Um, so of these, of the cases that we have yet to review, um, approximately, and you know, just to just to give you the numbers again, uh, so we've got about 2,400 of those. Approximately 80% of them, anywhere from 60 to 80% of them, will become actual cases. That is to say, 20 to 40% of them will be duplicate results. Now, in some states, they don't deduplicate the results, but we think it's really important to provide an accurate case number. So of those 2,400, anywhere from 20 to 40% will be removed because they will thought, be thought to be duplicates. As we move through the backlog of those cases, the number of new cases will be a function of two things. Some of it is a function of new cases that have been reported into us in the 24 hours prior some of it is also a portion of the backlog that we are picking up. So what that means is that for the, fourth, for the next several days, if not even a bit longer, as we make our way through that, there will be a higher than average number of new cases per day at a sustained high level. And the second is some of those cases will be from the recent 24 hours. Some of them will be from 48 hours prior. Uh, let me go to Chris Costa next. Hey, Dr. Sean. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, just given what we've been seeing in terms of the rising case rates, and I know that uh, that obviously comes with a little bit of an asterisk given what we just discussed, um, but also the hospitalizations as well. 
Has there been discussion between you, your colleagues, and, and other state officials about what the benchmarks might be for uh, if the state were to go into a new state of emergency? Has that been talked about at all? And, and what would those benchmarks hypothetically be? Well, Chris, I it's, it's again, certainly um, it's been something that's been on our minds. Um, we haven't, we're, we're not approaching it sort of by benchmark other than I think hospital capacity. Um, and right now, even though our hospital capacity is something that is a note, it's something that I'm, I've noted I'm, I'm concerned about, we, we still have 42 available critical care beds. A number of that has seen a high degree of fluctuation. Uh, within a week, that number can go from 40 to 70 and then back down to 40, largely based on staffing patterns. Uh, but Chris, I don't, I don't want to speculate there. We, we do not have a, a preset series of benchmarks that would govern exactly when and how we might go back into a state of emergency. The other, the reason, Chris, or the other piece of that calculus is what, what does the state of emergency afford us that can't already be done right now? Principally, what the state of emergency does is streamline things like procurement and such matters, uh, largely somewhat are Cane administrative things, uh, but that greatly help us when we need it. Uh, right now, because we've stockpiled PPE, stockpiled testing supplies at our lab here in Heddle, such things, we really have to do a deep examination of what a state of emergency provides or affords to us that we can't already achieve in the status quo. Understood. Um, if, I, if I may, I'd like to ask a, a question from a viewer. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it may need some explanation and some context from you, if you don't mind. Um, this, this viewer is asking, right now there are certain children that cannot get vaccinated, basically anybody under the age of 12. Um, does that mean that the virus is circulating in a subset of people more than in vaccinated adults? And I think what, I think what this person is trying to get at is, is there a possibility that there would be a, a mutation, a variant of the virus that would affect kids more than it would affect the rest of the population who has the opportunity to get vaccinated if they have already done so? That's an interesting question, Chris. Um, the bottom line is based on briefings and conversations I've had with expert virologists and immunologists and such, um, the, the, the concern around a new variant emerging because of unvaccinated kids, uh, it seems to be low. Um, the new variants tend to emerge in great sets of populations uh, that are largely unvaccinated. For example, the Delta variant first starting to emerge in South Asia and the UK when vaccination rates were low, the Lambda variant in Peru, the Mu variant in Colombia, um, and, that, and then even before that, the P1 variant in Brazil. I'm not saying it can't happen, but generally these mutations arise uh, among large, large populations where the virus can mutate at a high rate because it's moving from person to person, rather than dispersed populations like kids in the new, in the Northeast because of the way that adults block them. I don't think I don't think the chances of that happening are zero. It's a pandemic. All sorts of craziness can happen, but it's not something that would keep me up at night. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Chris, while, while you raise it, I think it is just important to touch on where we are with respect to kids in the pandemic. Um, it, it's, I want to acknowledge here that it's, it's a bit dizzying. Uh, on one hand, uh, we're all deeply concerned about our kids, making sure they stay safe as we talk about going back to school. On the other hand, there continues to be relatively reassuring data on the fact that kids, although they definitely can be affected by COVID, are not as seriously affected by COVID as our adults. For example, as of yesterday in the entire state of Maine, thankfully, based on Maine CDC data, there was one child in the hospital. Now cases among kids have been going up and that's a concern. Hospitalizations nationwide have also been going up. But what hasn't gone up is the severity of those kids who are in the hospital. This is based on some US CDC data that were released last week. So this is concerning. And where we are with COVID in kids and arguably with COVID in adults is that on one hand, the risk is high enough that you can't ignore it. But on the other hand, 
the risk is also low enough such that you can't let it interfere with the activities of normal daily life. Uh, let me go to Amy Brown next. Thanks, Dr. Shah. You said in the past it's not possible to accurately break down the newly daily case numbers, the newly posted ones by vaccination status because you'd need to go and investigate. That information doesn't come through, obviously, with the positive tests. But what about doing that for the hospitalization numbers each day? Uh, they're high enough now that that doesn't seem like it would compromise anyone's privacy. You wouldn't be able to determine uh, as easily as if they were like three people hospitalized and the CDC was saying what their vaccination status was. Because that's a lot of the questions that we get and something that you've been addressing at each briefing is what percentage of people who are severely impacted are vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. Oh, Amy, we do that about once a week. Uh, we haven't seen much epidemiological change from that. Uh, it's been hovering at around 70 to 75 percent, with ICUs being well north of 90 percent. Um, and for epidemiological decision making purposes, once a week tells us about what we need to know. Okay, that's on the, the database, the main CDC database? That I'm not sure about. I'm okay. not sure if we've got it on our website, but okay. that's the frequency with which we pull it. Uh, every one of these data analyses requires a team of people not to do something else in order to do this. Right. Uh, if we, we could do it every day, we could do it twice a day. But the question is, on what frequency do we need to know data in order to make informed decisions? And here, where we've achieved a relative amount of stasis with the percentage that are not fully vaccinated in the hospital, once a week meets our needs. Okay. Uh, my second question might be more of something that I should ask Commissioner Lambrew, but I'm just going to ask because it builds on something you've been talking about. In case you know, what percentage of people who have landed in the hospital roughly are uninsured or insured through main care or Medicare? Um, that, that is a good question. And I have been briefed on this by Director Michelle Probert from Maine Care. I have a number in my head that I don't want to give you a, or anchor on a number that's incorrect. So we will we will get you the answer. Or uh, if, if you could reach out to DHHS or Maine Care, uh, they they do have that analysis. Again, I've got a number in my head, but it's been a couple of uh, it's been a week or two, and I don't want to give you the wrong number. Okay, would you estimate that it's more than fifty percent? Amy, you know me. I won't won't estimate. There's a okay. number out there. <laughs> Uh, and we and we will get you what that what that number is. Okay. Uh, this next question I think is more uh, in your ballpark. A, a World Health Organization representative said at a press briefing yesterday that he thinks the virus is here to stay because it wasn't contained early enough, and now it's beyond the point where we'll ever where it will ever be eradicated. Uh, other public health professionals have said that similar things. I just wanted to see if you agree with that and then what that means, what that looks like. Does it gradually just get milder to the point where it's like a cold or flu? Uh, or are we just going to have to live like this for indefinitely until enough people get sick with it that there's herd immunity that way? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that is arguably right now, Andy, the $64,000 question. Um, as to the former piece, I agree. Um, COVID in some form or another is likely to be a fixture for the way that we, we go about ourselves, uh, certainly here in the United States, probably even worldwide. Um, but what that means, what it looks like, that's gonna be the key. For, for me, um, th there are different scenarios. I mean, one could be this low level, it's just always something that's there. Another scenario is that there could be seasonal spikes as we experience with pretty much every other respiratory virus. Um, the other could be some variation on those two, which is we have health facility outbreaks, so on and so forth, and different combinations thereof. I don't know the answer there, Amy. It's anybody's guess, and it's utter speculation to really know what it will look like. What I will tell you is that the frame of mind or the frame of reference that we're thinking about internally for our operations is um, to achieve parity with influenza, which has an incidence of about one to two cases per 100,000 per day 
during the peak season. Um, so if we can achieve parity with influenza, a, a disease that we're used to, a disease whose risk we understand and have largely accepted, then that is at least one metric for what success might look like. Uh, we're not in a world where success with COVID is zero cases. Eradication is not going to happen, at least not anytime soon, uh, especially with a respiratory virus. It's exceedingly difficult to do. But what that movie looks like going forward, that's, that's a good question. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, over to Caitlin Andrews next. Hey, good afternoon, Dr. Shah. Um, first, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, testing. Do you think this demand is, first of all, going to be a consistent factor of the pandemic going forward? And what do you think that says about where we are in the state? Boy, it's, uh, I wish I were into speculating, um, but unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, so for a while, Caitlin, certainly while we're in the midst uh, of, of the Delta surge, this demand for testing is going to be with us. Uh, and hence, the, 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 the moves that I talked about earlier uh, and the resources we're throwing at testing to expand it. I don't know how long that surge is going to be around for, but certainly right now and for the foreseeable future, we anticipate that there will be um, significant demand for testing. But at some point, the Delta surge will be over. I don't know when. So then, Caitlin, the question is, what does testing look like in that world? Um, will it go back largely to, say, surveillance testing for healthcare workers? Well, uh, I, I'm not sure what the answer is. There will still be a need for COVID testing as there is a need for measles testing and influenza testing and RSV testing. But what that looks like and how it ebbs and flows over the, over the months and through the seasons, that's similar to Amy's question. That's, that's really one of the biggest questions out there. It's not only important um, from, a, from an infectious disease perspective, it's really critically important from a planning perspective because we need to know what sorts of resources we should be setting aside for testing and such. A lot of this gets into speculation and I can't, I don't wanna speculate about why I don't speculate, but speculating is not something generally that I like to do. Of course. Um, can you give me an idea of how long people can expect a delay in their results and what they should be doing in the interim? Yeah, it varies. Um, I've, and this is by report, Caitlin. So uh, here's, let me, let's start with the data that I know and then turn to the data by report. Uh, the turnaround time for tests at our laboratory here in Augusta remains right around 24 hours. But because of the demand and what our public, uh, and what our public health laboratory is really designed to do, that laboratory right now is focused on outbreak testing predominantly in healthcare facilities, nursing homes, places like that. And we are still, because of the critical importance of outbreaks and particularly in healthcare facilities, we're still meeting that 24 hour turnaround time, even though candidly, uh, our lab has been swamped. Um, for one-on-one -on -one individual diagnostic testing that you may get, at a hospital, a clinic, or a pharmacy, the turnaround time has varied. Uh, some of those pharmacies send their samples to, for example, a large laboratory in Tennessee. Uh, I spoke with somebody uh, just earlier today who, got a, who, who went for testing on Monday and got their results back ex almost exactly 48 hours later. I've also heard from others that in certain parts of the state, that turnaround time for for pharmacies has been stretching three plus days, which starts to limit the utility of it. Um, so I think, Caitlin, the answer there is that it varies. Okay, and then um, my last question, I was kind of intrigued by um, your comments around the idea of a, another state of emergency. And it seemed like you were kind of saying that you feel like one of the things the state has that prevents it from going to that mode now is that it has like enough supplies um, to not necessarily kind of need to mobilize on things like that. You know, you talked about having enough like testing and things of that nature. Um, and so I guess I wanted to ask a little bit more about like the hospital capacity question. Like, would you, or, you know, like, have you heard anything about maybe putting in stand up sites again, or, um, you know, would that be like a level of where you'd be like, we really do need to have a state of emergency. Can you just expound upon that a little more? 
Yeah, um, you know, that, that would be that's a scenario under which we would want to start having that state of emergency discussion. I just want to just be crystal clear for both you and Chris. Um, it, it's not something that's under active consideration or discussion right now, uh, mainly, again, because we'd have to couple it with the what do you get for that? And right now, what we need to do in the pandemic is within our ambit. Uh, but in terms of the relationship between the state of emergency and the so-called alternative care sites, with the sites in general, Caitlin, we're not there yet. Uh, and I don't really, I hope we don't need to be there. We still do have sufficient capacity, even though it's strained and healthcare workers are burning from both ends. We're not at a point where uh, erecting a tent is going to solve those challenges. We have ICU beds. We have an ample number of ventilators, for example. So it's even though we've continued those discussions because that's the responsible thing to do, it's not something that we're actively planning on moving out. One of the challenges is there is that even if we were to stand up a tent hospital, still need staff for it. And that's really the rate limiting step. But thankfully, again, the hospitals, and we've checked in with them twice already today, uh, the hospitals, even though they are strained, do have capacity at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, and the last question for the afternoon goes to Corey at WAGM. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, so my first question here is, a few weeks ago you said the Delta variant was not just the prominent strain uh, um, of the virus, but that it was the strain of the virus for Maine. Um, are we still seeing that as far as the genome sequencing or uh, is the, the mu variant kind of like creeping up on, on that? No, uh, Corey, the Delta variant continues to be the strain of COVID-19 in the entire state. Uh, although we have detected a small number of mu variant samples, they barely register a blip. Uh, Right now in Maine, the Delta variant is the concern that's out there because of how contagious it is. We're getting to a point across the country and maybe even in Maine where either you get the shot or you get the Delta variant. It is that contagious, particularly as we go into chillier months with folks coming back inside. Uh, it, is, it is predominantly, it is not predominantly, it is what is circulating across the state. Thank you. And um, going off of that, going off of breakthrough cases, uh, we had a, a nursing home, a senior living facility up here, uh, Madigan Health Services, where um, they had they were part of one of your outbreak investigations. They had 13 cases. Uh, of those, nine of the individuals were vaccinated, and four of them were not. Um, so, is is the Delta variant more um, susceptible to those those breakthrough cases? Corey, based on everything we know right now, the Delta variant still remains susceptible to the vaccines, uh, perhaps just a little bit less than prior variants, alpha, beta, et cetera, but still extremely susceptible to the antibodies that are produced by the vaccine. But one important note, Corey, you may be thinking, well, wait a minute now, if the vaccine still works well, why did Madigan Health, did they have so many so-called breakthrough cases. Well, one important note there is that although the vaccines perform exceedingly well across the population, there are some groups where they don't perform as well as in others. And one such group are individuals who are elderly and or who live in congregate settings because they're close together. In those settings, the vaccine's effectiveness may not be 90 or 92% but it may be a good bit lower, 60, 70, 80%. And that's one reason why we've seen cases of COVID-19 in nursing homes, even though a high number of people in those homes are vaccinated. Does that mean that the vaccine isn't any good? Absolutely not. People can still get into a car accident and injure themselves, even if they're wearing a seatbelt. It could be much worse without the seatbelt though. The vaccines are a similar way. They still work exceedingly well, Nothing in medicine is 100%, though. Thank you. Great. 
Uh, thank you uh, to Corey and thanks to all of our colleagues in the media for your questions. I wanna just end with one note around what you can do that is non-COVID related to start keeping yourself and your family safe this winter. And that comes down to one thing, getting your flu shot. Flu season is here. We have started publishing our weekly influenza reports. We're starting to see cases of the flu. No one knows whether this flu season is gonna be like last year's where flu largely was crushed or if it's gonna come back with a vengeance because no one had the flu last year. It's an open question, but despair not because you can soon, if not already, go and get your flu shot. It's one of the best things that you can do to help keep yourself and your, family, your entire family safe from, from influenza as we go into the colder months. So with that, thank you all for your time today. I hope everyone has a good afternoon and a good rest of the week. I look forward to checking in with everyone in about a week from now to talk about where we stand with respect to COVID-19. In the meantime, as always, please be kind and take care of one another. See everyone again soon.